Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. No, I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. And speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Ah. Oh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I've often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens. Is married life so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I've had very little experience of myself up to the present. I've only been married once. That was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir, it is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I'm sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Pleasure. Pleasure? What else should bring mine anyway? Eating as usual, I see, Angie. Well, I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbours. Neighbours. Got nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire? Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Eh? Shropshire? Hmm. Oh, yes, of course. Hello? Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Well, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. And may I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. But I thought you'd come up for pleasure. Like all that business. How utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love. But there is nothing romantic at all about a definite proposal. Why, one may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. Then the excitement is all over. And the very essence of romance is uncertainty. If ever I get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Algie. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Well, there's no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Now, please, don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. <laughs> You've been eating them all the time. That is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. Have some bread and butter. But the bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Mm. And very good bread and butter it is, too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat it as if you're going to eat it all. You can't behave as if you're married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. <laughs> that is nonsense. It isn't. It's a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algie, by Cecily? I don't know anybody by the name of Cecily. Mm. Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? Well, I wish to goodness you'd let me know I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. Well, it's not good offering a large reward now that I think it's found. I think that is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. However, it makes no matter. 
For now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. And you have no right whatsoever to read what's written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it's absurd to make a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. Now, this cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady she is, too, lives at Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Archie. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. That is absurd. Now, for heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle, hmm? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all, it's Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's Jack. You've always told me it was Ernest. Well, I've introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest-looking person I ever saw in my life. It's perfectly absurd you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards, yes, here is one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany. I'll keep this as a proof that your name is Ernest, if ever you attempt to deny it to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. And the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes. But that does not account for the fact that your small Aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Come, old boy, you'd much better have the thing out at once. I may mention that I've always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist. And I'm quite sure of it now. Bunbrist? What on earth do you mean by Bunbrist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now produce your explanation. And pray, make it improbable. My dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it is perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle, from motives of respect which you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You're not going to be invited. I may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bunburied all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. But go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algie, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It is one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear young Algy, is the whole truth, pure and simple. Well, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. A literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to people who haven't been at university. They do it so well in the daily papers. Now, what you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you were a Bunburyist. Well, you are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I shouldn't be able to dine with you tonight at the Savoy, for I've really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It's very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. Anyway, I can't dine at the Savoy. I owe them about 700 pounds. Well, why on earth don't you pay them? You've got heaps of money. Yes, but Ernest hasn't. Ernest is the sort of chap that never pays a bill. Then let us dine at Willis's. You had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. And I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it is not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. I mean, the amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad, it's simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a 
Confirmed, Bunburyist. I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. You're not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. In fact, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bore, so I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you do the same with Mr... with your invalid friend who has the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if ever you get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. <laughs> that is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life, three is company and two is none. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you at Willis's tonight? Oh, I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. Now, I hate people who are not serious about meals. It's so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I am feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. Uh, that's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear me, you are smart. I'm always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. It would leave me no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. I'm sorry if we are a little late, Algernon. I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Gwendolyn, won't you come and sit here? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens! Lane, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? Uh, no, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers. Not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its colour. From what cause, I, of course, cannot say. Thank you. I've quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. Such a nice woman, and so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your poor uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me. But the fact is, I've just received a telegram to say that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes. Poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, I think it is high time Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. The shilly shallying with the question is absurd. And nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I am always telling that to your poor uncle. He never seems to take any notice as far as any improvement in his ailment goes. I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season, when everyone has practically said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he is still conscious. And I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the programme I've drawn out for you, if you'll kindly come into the next room for a moment. Thank you, Algernon. It is very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the programme will be delightful. After a few expurgations, French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they are improper. 
and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed I believe is so. Uh, Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Charming day, it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. That makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. Yes, I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax. Ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I've ever met since I met you. Yes, I'm quite well aware of the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. As I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. Well, the fact is constantly being mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. Oh, there is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. From the moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. You don't really mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. <laughs> yes, I know it is. But supposing it was something else, you really mean to say you couldn't love me then? That is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. <laughs> to speak quite candidly, darling, I, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a, a music of its own. It produces... vibrations. <laughs> really, Gwendolyn. I must say, I, I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I, I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? Oh, no, there's very little music in the name of Jack, if any at all, indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John. And I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. <laughs> we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthy? Well, surely. You know that I love you. You led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. But may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Gwendolyn! Yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? You know what I've got to say to you? Yes, but you don't see it. Oh, come on, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. <laughs> how long you've been about it, I'm afraid you've had very little experience in how to propose. My own one, I've never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does, all my girlfriends tell me. <gasps> what wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They're quite, quite. I hope you will always look at me just like that. Especially when there are other people present. 
Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come upon a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter she could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolen, will wait for me below in the carriage. Oh, Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolen. Yes, Mama. Gwendolen, the carriage. Yes, Mama. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men, although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite willing to enter your name should your answers be what a rarely affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit, I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. Uh, what is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investment? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected from one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 acres, I believe. Oh, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people that make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Uh, well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. Uh, you have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolen could hardly be expected to reside in the country. I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back any time I like at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, uh, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number, Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Uh, do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? <laughs> well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us or come in the evening at any rate. Now, two minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, might be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. 
Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... Well, I was found. Found? Yes, the late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an elderly gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. And where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, I was in a handbag, Lady Bracknell. A, a somewhat large black leather handbag with, with handles to it. A very ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardio come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes. The Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I confess I am somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As to the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion. Indeed, has probably been used for that purpose more than once. But it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognised position in good society. May I ask you then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say that I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolen's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment it is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Kindly open the door for me, sir. You will, of course, understand that for the future, there is to be no communication whatsoever between you and Miss Fairfax. Good day to you, sir. Good day, Lady Bracknell. For heaven's sake, Algy, don't play the ghastly tune. How idiotic you are. <sighs> Did it go off all right, old boy? Oh, don't mean to say that Gwendolen refused you. I know it is the way she has. She's always refusing people. I think it is most ill-natured of her. Gwendolen is right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we're engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. I've never met such a gorgon. I don't even know what a gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Angie. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct about when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. But that is exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't suppose there's much chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, Aunt? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased. And quite as true as any observation in civilised life should be. I'm sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is so clever now. One can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. 
What do they talk about? The fools, or about the clever people, of course. <sighs> what fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. Well, the only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty, and to someone else if she is plain. That is nonsense. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I shall say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Uh, yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's a sort of thing that runs in families. No, you would much better say a severe chill. You are sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? No, of course not. Very well. My poor brother Ernest is carried off in Paris quite suddenly by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you said that Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? Oh, that's all right. Cecily is not, I'm glad to say, a silly romantic girl. She has a capital appetite, goes long walks and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. I will take very good care you never do. She is excessively pretty and only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? Oh. One doesn't blurt these things out to people. Gwendolyn and Cecily are perfectly certain to be absolutely great friends. I bet you anything you like. That half an hour after they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. Women only do that when they've called each other a lot of other things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want a good table at Willis's tonight, we really must go and dress. Do you know it's nearly seven? Go, oh, it always is nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. Miss Fairfax. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthy. No, really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But... Although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Oh, dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin is related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Now, your town address at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? Uh, the, the manor house. Woolton, Hertfordshire. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. Oh, oh man. How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn round now. Thanks, I've turned round already. You may also ring the bell. You will allow me to see you to your carriage, my own darling. Certainly. I shall see Miss Fairfax now. Yes, A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bunburying. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. There's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. <laughs> what on earth are you so amused at? Oh, I'm a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that is all. If you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They are the only things that are never serious. No, that is nonsense. Algy, you never talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. occupation as the watering of flowers is rather Milton's duty than yours, especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. 
Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he is leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious, I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanour is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I'm surprised at you. Mr Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I'm sure you certainly would. You know German and geology, and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I'm not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I'm not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that had never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. Do not speak slightingly of three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself. In earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child. These speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Oh, Dr. Chasuble, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well? Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I've not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet? We do not expect him until Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He's not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment. As by all accounts, that unfortunate young man, his brother, seems to be. <laughs> but I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical allusion, merely. Drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong. I think, dear Doctor, I will take a stroll with you. I find I have a headache, after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Grissom, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. Oh, that would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee, you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Horrid political economy, horrid geography, horrid, horrid German. And Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Uh, yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you'd better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Uh, yes, miss. 
I have never met a really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. Sir? I'm so afraid he will look just like everyone else. He does. You were my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother, my cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, I'm not really wicked at all, cousin Cecily. You mustn't think that I am wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Oh. Well, of course, I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. In fact, now you mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that. Though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It's much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you were here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back until Monday afternoon. It's a great disappointment. I'm obliged to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I am anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No. The appointment is in London. Well, I know, of course, how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to talk to you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. He has gone up to buy your outfit. Oh, well, I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you will require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Oh. Well, the accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? <sighs> I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, Cousin Cecily, if you don't mind. I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You're looking a little worse. That's because I'm hungry. Oh, how thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have a buttonhole first? <laughs> I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A Maréchal Neal? No, I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Because you were like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You were the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. You're too much alone, dear Dr. Chasuble. You should get married. The misanthrope, I can understand. A womanthrope, never. Oh, believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. Well, that is obviously why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. <laughs> You do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often I've been told not even to her. That depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. Where is Cecily? Oh, perhaps she followed us to the schools. Mr. Worthing. Mr. Worthing? Well, this is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than expected. Dr. 
Dr. Chasuble, I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful debts and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead. Your brother, Ernest, dead. Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolence. You have at least the consolation of knowing you were always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No, he died abroad. In Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Oh, charity, dear Miss Prism Charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. <laughs> Will the interment take place here? No. He seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? I fear that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. You would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manor in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion. Joyful, or as in the present case, distressing. And I have preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation and festal days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral as a charity sermon on behalf of the Society for the Prevention of Discontent Among the Upper Orders. The bishop who was present was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. Uh, that reminds me. You mentioned christenings, I think, Dr. Chesman. I suppose you know how to christen, all right? I mean, of course, you're continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I've often spoken to the poorer classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. But is there any particular infant in whom you are interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. But it is not for any child, dear doctor. I'm very fond of children. No, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you've nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you've been christened already? I don't remember anything about it. But have you any grave doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. Of course. I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way or if you think I'm a little too old now. Oh, not at all, no. The sprinkling and indeed the immersion of adults is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? Oh, you need have no apprehensions. Sprinkling is all that is necessary. Or indeed, I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. At what hour would you like the ceremony performed? Well, I might trot down about five, if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. In fact, I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Jenkins, the carter, a most hard-working man. Oh, I don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. That would be childish. At half past five, do. Admirably, admirably. <sighs> and now, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow. I would merely beg you not to be too much bowed down by grief. What seem to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. Uncle Jack! Oh, I am pleased to see you back. But what horrid clothes you've got on. Do go and change them. Cecily! My child, my child. What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Oh, do look happy. You look as if you had toothache. And I have got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Your brother, Ernest, he arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense, I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he's still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. After we'd been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother is in the dining room. I don't know what it all means. I think this is perfectly absurd. Good heavens! Brother John, I have come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I have given you and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Uncle Jack, you're not going to refuse your own brother's hand. 
Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think he's coming down here disgracefully. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. He's been telling you about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury? Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or about anything else. It's enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course, I admit that the faults were all on my side, but I must say, I think Brother John's coldness to me peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. It's pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. I beg your pardon, sir. There is an elderly gentleman wishes to see you. He has just come in a cab from the station. To see me? Yes, sir. Parker and Gribsby, solicitors. I don't know anything about them. Who are they? Ah. Uh, you'd better show him in, Merriman. Oh, very good, sir. Parker and Gribsby. I wonder who they can be. I expect to understand come about some business for your friend, Bunbury. Perhaps Bunbury wants to make his will and wishes you to be executor. I hope, Ernest, you have no outstanding accounts of any kind. I haven't any debts at all, dear Jack, thanks to your generosity. Uh, Mr. Gribsby. Mr. Ernest Worthing. This is Mr. Ernest Worthing. Mr. Ernest Worthing. Yes. Of B4, the Albany. Uh, yes, that is my address. I am very sorry, sir, but we have a writ of attachment against you for 20 days at the suit of the Savoy Hotel Company Limited for £762, 14 shillings and twopence. Against me? Yes, sir. Well, what perfect nonsense! I never dined at the Savoy at my own expense. I always dine at Willis's. It is far more expensive. I don't owe a penny to the Savoy. The summons is marked on the writ as having been served on you personally at the Albany on May the 27th. Judgment was given in default against you on June the 5th. Since then, we have written to you no less than 15 times without receiving any reply. In the interests of our clients, we had no option but to obtain an order for the committal of your person. Committal? Well, what on earth do you mean by committal? I haven't the smallest intention of going away. I'm staying here for a week. I'm staying with my brother. If you imagine that I'm going up to town the moment I arrive, you are extremely mistaken. I am merely a solicitor myself. I do not employ personal violence of any kind. The officer of the court whose function it is to seize the person of the debtor, is waiting in the fly outside. He has considerable experience in these matters. That is why we always employ him. But no doubt you will prefer to pay the bill. Pay it? How on earth am I going to do that? You don't suppose I've got any money? How perfectly silly you are. No gentleman ever has any money. My experience is that it is usually relations who pay. Jack, you really must settle this bill. Kindly allow me to see the particular items, Mr. Gribsby. 762 pounds, 14 shillings and tuppence since last October. I am bound to say I never saw such reckless extravagance in all my life. 762 pounds for eating? We are far away from Wordsworth's plain living and high thinking. And now, dear doctor, do you consider that I am in any way called upon to pay this monstrous account for my brother? I am bound to say I do not think This so. proposed incarceration could be most salutary. I am quite of your opinion. My dear fellow, how ridiculous you are. You know perfectly well that this bill is really yours. My yes, you know it is. Mr. Worthing, if this is a jest, it is out of place. It is gross effrontery. Never mind what he says. This is the way he always goes on. You mean now to say you are not Ernest Worthing, residing at B4 the Albany. I wonder, as you're at it, you don't deny being my brother at all. Why don't you? Well, I'm not going to do that, my dear fellow. It would be absurd. Of course I'm your brother. And that is why you should pay this bill for me. Time presses. We have to be at Holloway not later than four o'clock. Otherwise, it is difficult to obtain admission. The rules are very strict. Holloway? It is at Holloway that detentions of this character take place always. Will you kindly come now, sir, if it will not be inconvenient to you? Jack! Pray be firm, Mr. Worthing. I'm quite firm, and I don't know what weakness or deception of any kind is. Uncle Jack, I think you have a little money of mine, haven't you? Let me pay this bill. I wouldn't like your own brother to be in prison. Oh, I couldn't possibly let you pay it, Cecily. It would be absurd. Then you will, won't you? Of course, I'm quite disappointed with him. 
You won't speak to him again, Cecily, will you? Certainly not. Unless, of course, he speaks to me first. It would be very rude not to answer him. Mr. Gribsby? Yes, sir? I shall pay this bill for my brother. And it is the last bill I shall ever pay for him, too. How much is it? £762.14 and tuppence. Ah, the cab will be five and nine pence extra, hired for the convenience of the client. Of course. Purple I must purple say, purple I find this piece, generosity sir. quite foolish. The heart has its wisdom as well as the head, Miss Prism. Thank you. Good day. Good day. Good day, sir. I hope I shall have the pleasure of meeting you again. I sincerely hope not. Right, sir. Right. I think we might leave the brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. You young scoundrel, Algie, you must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bun ring here. I have put Mr. Ernie's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Uh, Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. <laughs> what a fearful liar you are, Jack. I haven't been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. Your duty as a gentleman called you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. What earth did you up and change? It's perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who's actually staying for a whole week with you in your own house as a guest. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave by the 4-5 train. Well, I certainly won't leave you so long as you are in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. I should think it most unkind if you didn't. Will you go if I change my clothes? Yes. If you don't take too long. I never saw anyone take so long to dress and with such little result. Well, at any rate, that is better than always being overdressed, as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct an outrage and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you have got to catch the 4-5 and I hope you will have a pleasant journey back to town. This bun ring, as you call it, hasn't been a great success for you. I think it has been a great success. I am in love with Cecily and that is everything. I promised Uncle Jack that I wouldn't speak to you again unless you asked me a question of some kind. Cecily, mayn't I stay to tea? I wonder you can look me in the face after your conduct. I love looking you in the face. But why did you try to put your horrid bill on poor Uncle Jack? I think that was inexcusable of you. Where's Uncle Jack gone? He's gone to order the dog cart for me. He's going to send me away. Then we have got to part. I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. But even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. Uh, the dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. I hope I shall not offend you, Cecily, if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it, may I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I'm quite ready for more. <clears throat> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. Cecily, ever since I looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have not merely been your abject slave and servant, but soaring upon the pinions of a possibly monstrous ambition, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly. Oh! Please say that all over again. Cecily, Ever since I first yes, looked upon... that, all right. Well, I, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. 
hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Oh, Cecily. Is that the beginning of an entirely new paragraph? The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come round next week at the same hour. Yes. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care for anyone in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy, of course. Why, we've been engaged for the last six months. For the last six months? Yes, it will be exactly six months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well... Ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling. But when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or another. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you out here in the garden. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name. And this little bangle with a true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. Oh, did I give you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Yes, you've wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for your leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. My letters? But my own sweet Cecily, I have never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. You couldn't possibly. They'd make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelt that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you like. Today, I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. But why on earth did you break it off? Well, Cecily, what had I done? I, I, I had done nothing at all. Cecily, I'm very much hurt indeed to hear you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. Well, it would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. Dear romantic boy. Oh. But, Cecily, you'll never break off our engagement again. I don't think I could break it off now that I've actually met you. Besides, of course, there is the question of your name. <laughs> yes, of course. I... Well, you mustn't laugh at me, darling, but it has always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. There is something in that name which seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But, my dear child, do you mean to say you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Ooh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name of Algernon. Well, my own dear, sweet, loving little darling, I really can't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It is not at all a bad name. In fact, it is a rather aristocratic name. Now, half the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. No, but seriously, Cecily, if my name was Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character. But I fear I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. Cecily, your rector here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in the practice of all the rites and ceremonials of the church. Yes, Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on our most important christening. I mean, on most important business. Oh. I shan't be away more than half an hour. Considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th, and that I only met you today for the first time, I think it is rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. What an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must enter his proposal in my diary. Uh, Miss Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Worthing. On very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Worthing in his library? 
uh, Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Pray ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Worthing is sure to be back soon, and you can bring tea. Yes, miss. Miss Fairfax. I suppose one of the many good elderly women who were associated with Uncle Jack in some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. I think it is so forward of them. Miss Fairfax. Pray let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew. What a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we have known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then. That is all quite settled. Is it not? I hope so. Perhaps this might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You have never heard of Papa, I suppose? I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I am glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The home seems to me to be the proper sphere for the man. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of her system. So, do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I'm very fond of being looked at. You are here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also. Oh, no, I have no mother, nor, in fact, any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, it is strange he never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How very secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I am not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I am very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were... Well... Just a little older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance, in fact. If I may speak candidly... Pray do. I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42 and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. Oh. Oh, well, that accounts for it. Now that I think of it, I've never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Oh, Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. 
I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little country newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. My darling Cecily, I feel there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It's certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you, but I'm afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. If the poor boy has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I'm glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. But shall I lay tea here as usual, Miss? Yes, as usual. Interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in the town. Quite a well-kept garden, this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it. Miss Fairfax? I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country, if anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I have been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. A detestable girl, but I require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Or bread and butter? <laughs> bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays. <laughs> Hand that to Miss Fairfax. You have filled my tea with lumps of sugar. And though I ask most distinctly for bread and butter, you have given me cake. I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Cardew, you may go too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no lengths to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt that you were false and deceitful. 
I am never deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. Ernest! My own Ernest! Gwendolyn, darling! A moment. May I ask if you are engaged to be married to this... young lady? <laughs> dear little Cecily, of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. Jack! Oh! Here is Ernest. My own love. A moment, Ernest. May I ask you, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolyn. Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. I mean to Gwendolyn. Of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I felt there must be some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh! Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked, but my name certainly is John. It's been John for years. A gross deception has been practiced on both of us. My poor, wounded Cecily. My sweet, wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister, will you not? There is just one question I should like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea, Mr. Worthing. There is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life I have ever been reduced to such a painful position. And I'm really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly, I have no brother, Ernest. I have no brother at all. I have never had a brother, and I have certainly not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. No brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Never. Not even of any kind. I'm afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. Not a very pleasant position for a young girl to suddenly find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No. Men are so cowardly, aren't they? This ghastly state of things is what you call bunbring, I suppose. Yes. Perfectly wonderful Bunbury it is, too. The most wonderful Bunbury I've ever had in my life. Well, you have no right whatsoever to Bunbury here. That's absurd. One has a perfect right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunburyist knows that. Serious Bunburyist? Good heavens! Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement in life. As for your conduct toward Miss Cardia, I must say that you're taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable. To say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. I can see no possible defense at all for your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax. To say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I want you to be engaged to Gwendolyn. That is all I love her. Well, I simply want you to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is certainly no chance of your marrying Miss Carson. I don't think there's much likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax being united. Well, that is no business of yours. If it was my business, I shouldn't talk about it. It's very vulgar to talk about one's business. Any people like stockbrokers do that, and then merely at dinner parties. How you can sit there, calmly eating muffins, when we're in this horrible trouble, I can't make out. You seem to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter would probably get in my cuffs. I'm eating muffins because I am unhappy. Besides, I am particularly fond of muffins. Well, that is no reason why you should eat them all in that greedy way. 
I wish you'd have some tea cake instead. I don't like tea cake. Good heavens, I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you've just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. I said it was perfectly heartless of you under the circumstances. That is quite a different thing. That may be, but the muffins are the same. Andre, I wish to goodness you would go. You can't possibly ask me to go without having some dinner. It's absurd. I never go without my dinner. No one ever does, except for vegetarians and people like that. Oh, that is nonsense. You never took anything but nonsense. Jack, you're at the muffins again. Angie, I've already asked you to go. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea, and there is still one muffin left. The fact that they did not follow us at once into the house as anyone else would have done seems to me to show they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? They haven't got a cough. They're looking at us. What effrontery! They're approaching. That's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It is the only thing to do now. <whistles> this dignified silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr. Worthing! I have something very particular to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't. But that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German scepticism. The explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. And you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. True. I had forgotten there are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. But which of us should tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly all speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time from me? Certainly. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Oh, Christian names? Is, is that, that all? all? But, but we, we are going, going to be christened this afternoon. For my sake, you are prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me, you're ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. They have moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. Darling. Ahem, ahem, Lady Bracknell. Good heavens. Gwendolen, what does this mean? Merely that I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, of physical weakness in the old. Apprised, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I followed her at once by luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the University Extension Scheme on the influence of a permanent income on thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. I would consider it wrong. But of course you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bradley. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards Algernon. 
Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh, no, Bunbury doesn't live here. Uh, Bunbury is somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I, I, mean, I mean, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. Uh, what did he die of? Bunbury? Oh, he was quite exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, I mean he was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury could not live. That's what I mean. So poor Bunbury died. He seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardia, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. I do not know if there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air in this particular part of Hertfordshire. But the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. <coughs> Mr. Worthing. Is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew, of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporran, Fifeshire. NB. That sounds not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They are open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. I have known strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Markby, Markby and Markby. Markby, Markby and Markby. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I'm told that one of the Mr. Marquis is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How oh, extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I have also in my possession, you'll be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles. Both the English and the German variety. Ah, a life crowded with incident, I see. Though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I am not myself in favour of premature experiences. Gwendolen, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about £130,000 in the funds. That is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen you. A moment, Mr. Worthing. A hundred and thirty thousand pounds. And in the funds. Miss Cardew seems to be a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. Few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities. Any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come over here, dear. Pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple. And your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. But we can soon alter all that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvellous result in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing. And after three months, 
Her own husband did not know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. Kindly turn round, sweet child. No, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. Chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on how the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. Algernon. Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world. And I don't care tuppence for social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. Dear child. Of course, you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend upon. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Now, do speak quite frankly. I am not in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. I beg pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell. But this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian. And she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I might almost say, an ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew, but the fact is, I do not approve at all of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew, Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London, on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I've just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Perrier Jouet Brut 89, a wine I was specially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. What makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he was perfectly well aware from the first that I have no brother, that I never had a brother, and that I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself this afternoon. Uh -huh. After careful consideration, Mr. Worthing, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. That is extremely generous of you, Lady Bracknell. However, my decision remains unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Sweet child, come here. How old are you? Well, I'm really only 18, but I always admit to 20 when I go to evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me for interrupting you again, Lady Brack. But I think it's only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age till she is 35. That does not seem to me to be a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have of their own free choice remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbleton is an instance in point. To my own knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which is many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not be even still more attractive at the age you mention than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algy, 
Could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not punctual myself, I know. But I do like punctuality in others. And waiting even to be married is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr Moncrief. My dear Mr Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait until she is 35, a remark which I'm bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But, my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage to Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware, sir, that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? The idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptised. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that that is the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand, then, that there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that, as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savour of the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, as your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell, I am on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education. She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I've been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Prism. Come here, Prism. Prism. Where is that baby? Twenty-eight years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104 Grosvenor Square, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared, as usual, to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours in a moment of mental abstraction for which I never can forgive myself. I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet. 
and placed the baby in my handbag. Where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria. The Brighton Line. I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait for you all my life. What do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr. Treasurable. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered the thing. Hmm. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if he was having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They're always vulgar and often convincing. It has stopped now. I wish he would arrive at some conclusion. This suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Is this the bag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It seems to be mine. Yes. Here is the injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. Here is the stain on the lining caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred at Leamington. And here on the lock are my initials. I'd forgotten that in an extravagant mood I had them placed there. Oh, the bag is undoubtedly mine. I am delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It's been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more to you is restored than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes. Oh, Mother. Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. Unmarried? I do not deny that is a serious blow. But after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and one for women? Mother, I forgive you. M Mr. Worthing, there is some error. There is the lady who can tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you kindly inform me who I am? I am afraid the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. Algernon's elder brother? Algernon's elder brother? <sighs> then I have a brother after all. I always said I had a brother. I knew I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have doubted I had a brother? Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Algy, you will have to treat me with more respect in the future. You've never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not until today, old boy, I admit. However, I did my best, though I was out of practice. My own? But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you have become someone else? Oh, God. I'd quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change except in my affections. What a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question had better be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta. A moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. <laughs> then I had been christened. That is settled now. What name was I given? 
let me know the worst. Being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes. But what was my father's Christian name? I cannot at the moment recall what the general's Christian name was. I have no doubt he had one. Uh, he was eccentric, I admit, but only in later years. And that was the result of the Indian climate and marriage and indigestion and other things of that kind. Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we weren't even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. Miss... His name would appear in the army lists of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. Uh, the general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. But I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The army lists of the last 40 years are here. These delightful records should have been my constant study. Um, generals, Mallon, Max Bowman, Magley. What ghastly names they have. Markby, Migsby, Mobs, Moncrief. Lieutenant, 1840. Captain. Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel. General, 1869. Christian names. Ernest. John. <gasps> I always told you, Gwendolyn, my name is Ernest, didn't I? Well, it is Ernest after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes. I remember now that the general was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the first you could have no other name. It is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he's been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you ever forgive me? I can, for I feel that you are sure to change. Oh, my own man. I have come to the conclusion that the primitive church was in error on certain points. Miss Prism, Letitia, I beg to solicit the honor of your hand. Frederick, at last. Cecily, at last. Gwendolyn, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I have now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest.
no question, Basil. It's the best thing you've ever done. You'll have to send it to the Grosvenor. The Academy is too large and too vulgar. Whenever I've gone there, there have either been so many people that I've not been able to see the pictures, which was dreadful, or so many pictures that I've not been able to see the people, which was worse. <laughs> the Grosvenor's really the only place. I don't think I'll send it anywhere. No, I shan't send it anywhere. My dear fellow, why? What an odd lot you painters are. You do anything in the world to gain a reputation, and then as soon as you've got one, you seem to want to throw it away. I knew you'd laugh at me. It's just simply that I can't exhibit it. I put too much of myself into it. You flatter yourself, my dear Basil. I don't see any resemblance between you and this remarkable creature. Real beauty ends where intellectual expression begins, which is yours. Intellect itself is a mode of exaggeration. It quite spoils the harmony of any face you become all nose or all forehead or something horrid. <laughs> Look at the successful men in any of the learned professions, except, of course, in the church. But then in the church, they don't think. A bishop keeps on saying at the age of 80 what he was told to say as a boy at the age of 18. So he's inclined to look fairly delightful. I'm sure the mysterious young fellow in that picture illustrates that. No, Basil, you don't resemble him in the least. As a matter of fact, I should be sorry to look like him. You know, it's best not to be too different. The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. They can sit at their ease and gape at the play. Your rank and wealth, Harry. My art, whatever that may be worth or not. Dorian Gray's looks, oh, we shall all suffer for what the gods have loaded us with. Dorian Gray? So that's his name? Yes, I didn't mean to tell you. But why not? People I like, I never give their names. It's like giving them up. I've come to love secrecy. Do you know, it seems to be the one thing that can begin to make life better. I never tell people where I've gone to. I suppose you think that's absurd. Not at all, my dear Basil. You seem to forget that I am married. And the one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. I never know where my wife is, and my wife never knows what I am doing. We tell each other the most absurd stories with the most serious faces. <laughs> my wife's very good at it. Much better, in fact, than I am. You know, it's my belief that you're really a very good husband, but that you're thoroughly ashamed of your virtues. Your cynicism, Harry, is simply a pose. Being natural is simply a pose, and the most irritating pose I know. Oh, do let's go outside. It's so stuffy in here. Basil, I want you to explain to me why you don't want to exhibit Dorian Gray's picture. I want the real reason. I told you the real reason. No, no, no. You said it was because you put too much of yourself into it, which is childish. Harry, I think that every portrait that is painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist and not the sitter. He is merely the accident, the occasion. I can believe anything, provided that it's quite incredible. <laughs> well, simply, I, two months ago, I went to a crush at Lady Brandon's. Well, you know how we artists have to show ourselves in society every now and then, just to remind the public that we exist at all. Well, I'd been there about ten minutes, but I suddenly became conscious of somebody looking at me. I turned around and I saw Dorian Gray for the first time. Our eyes met. And I can only tell you that a curious sensation of terror came over me. And something seemed to tell me that I was on the verge of some crisis in my life. I turned away to get out of the room. It wasn't conscience, but cowardice of some kind. Conscience and cowardice are really the same thing, Basil. Conscience is simply the trade name of the firm, that's all. I don't believe that, Harry, and I don't believe that you do either. Well, whatever it was, I tried to get out of the room. And then suddenly, I came face to face with this young man and his personality. We were quite close by this time, and I asked Lady Brandon to introduce me. And how did she explain this extraordinary fellow? She generally treats her guests exactly like an auctioneer treats his goods, either explains them completely away or tells one everything about them except what one wants to know. Well, you are rather hard on a Harry. My dear friend, she tried to found a salon, only succeeded in opening a restaurant. <laughs> How could one admire her? But tell me, what did she eventually say? Oh, something like, uh, well, I don't know what he actually does. I don't think he does anything. Oh, yes, he plays the piano, or is it the violin, Mr. Gray? Well, of course, we both started laughing. And we seem to be friends right away. Laughter isn't at all a bad beginning for a friendship, and it's by far the best ending for one. You don't know what friendship is, Harry. Or what enmity is, for that matter. You like everyone. That is to say, you, you're indifferent to everyone. I choose my friends for their good looks, my acquaintances for their good characters, and my enemies for their good intellects. 
A man can't be too careful in his choice of enemies. I haven't one that's a fool. They're all men of some intellectual power, and consequently, they all appreciate me. But tell me more about Dorian Gray. He's absolutely necessary to my work. At the moment, almost daily. He's much more than a model or a sitter. I tell you, Harry, the work that I have done with him is the best work of my life. Basil, this is extraordinary. I must see him. He's simply an inspiration to me. You may see nothing in him. I think that I shall see everything, that's all. Well, then why won't you exhibit the portrait? Because there could seem to certain shallow prying eyes a certain artistic idolatry. We live in a time, Harry, when people think of art as a form of autobiography. I don't want that for him, or for myself. Is he fond of you? He likes me, I think. Though now and then he does seem to take a real delight in giving me pain. I flatter him. Perhaps you will tire quicker than he will. Genius lasts longer than beauty. No, I won't tire, Harry. You can't feel what I feel. You change too often. Those who are always faithful know only the trivial side of love. It's the faithless who know its tragedies. Ah, I've just remembered. What? The name. My Aunt Lady Agatha told me that she discovered some wonderful young creature who was going to help her in the East End. She never said anything about his being good-looking. Harry, I don't want you to meet him. What nonsense you do talk. Dorian. I beg your pardon, Basil. I didn't know you had anyone with you. Ah, uh, this is Lord Henry Wooden. I've just been hearing from Basil what a fine sitter you are. You're also one of my aunt's favorite victims, I'm afraid. I am in Lady Agatha's black books at present. I promised to go to a club with her in Whitechapel last Tuesday. Do you know I really forgot all about it? You look genuinely contrite about it. Oh, I will make your peace with my aunt. She's quite devoted to you. And I don't think it really matters about your not being there. You're too serious to go in for philanthropy, Mr. Gray. And profound. Come inside, Dorian. And Harry, do go after one of your do's or something. It seems I'm unwanted. Don't go. Basil is only in one of his starting order sulks, and besides, I'd like to know why you think I shouldn't go in for philanthropy. You don't really mind, Basil, do you? You've often told me you like your sitters to have someone to chat to. Well, there isn't much left to do, and Dorian's whims are laws to everyone except himself. So just sit, Harry. And Dorian. On with the coat. On to the platform. And try not to move about too much today. And don't take any notice of what he says. He's a very bad influence on all of his friends, except me. Is your influence really as bad as that? There's no such thing as a good influence. All influence is immoral. Why? Because to influence someone is to give him one's soul. That he no longer thinks his natural thoughts or burns with his natural passions. He's become the echo of someone else's music. The actor of a part that has not been written for him. To realize one's own nature as perfectly as one can. That's what we are for. People have forgotten the highest of all duties, the duty one owes to oneself. Dorian, I had a little on one side. I still believe that if a man could live out his life fully and completely... Yes? Give form to every thought, expression to every idea, and so on. Well, the world might forget its past maladies. We are punished for our refusals. The body sins once and is done with it. It's in the brain and the brain alone that the great sins of the world take place. You must know that, Mr. Gray. I've had passions that made you afraid, thoughts that filled you with terror, daydreams and sleeping dreams. Please stop. There's some answer to all you're saying, I know, but I can't find it for the moment. I'd like to think. Or not to. Basil, I'm getting weary standing up here. Just a little longer. It's so stifling in here. I'm sorry. I tend to forget about these things when I'm working. That was better than ever. Stillness. I don't know what Harry's been saying to you, but you certainly... Weren't being paid compliments, if that's what you mean. Whatever it was, don't believe a word he says. He's right. You are indeed a wonderful creation. You know more than you think you know, just as you know less than you want to know. You have the most marvelous youth. 
And that is the one thing worth having. Well, I don't feel that way, Lord Henry. Don't frown so, Mr. Gray. Beauty is a form of genius, higher in fact. It requires no explaining. It's one of the great facts of the world. Like sunlight on water or the darkness of seasons. It makes princes of those who have it. You smile. Ah, when you've lost it, it will be no time to smile. The mystery of the world is in the visible, not the invisible. Yes, Mr. Gray, the gods have been good to you for the present. But don't, don't squander the gold of your days. The moment I saw you, I knew that you were unconscious of what you might be. I felt I must tell you. Beauty fades, limbs fail, senses rot. Youth was absolutely nothing else in the world. Darian, I am waiting. You are glad that you have met me, Mr. Gray? Glad now. I wonder if I shall always be. Always. What a dreadful word it is. Women are so fond of using it. They spoil every romance by trying to make it last forever. It's also a meaningless word. The only difference between a caprice and a lifelong passion is that the caprice lasts slightly longer. In that case, perhaps our friendship should be a caprice. It's done. No more, as I thought. It's, it's quite done, just now. My dear fellow, you must be over the moon. It's the most brilliant modern portrait I've ever seen. It really is. Mr. Gray, come over and look at yourself. Is it really finished? Yes, quite finished. Yeah, I, I didn't think we'd do anything today. Oh, darling, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am. It's as if it's done itself. That's entirely due to me, isn't it? Dorian, what is it? Don't you like it? But of course he likes it. Who wouldn't? I'll give anything you like to ask for it, Basil. I must have it. It's not my property, Harry. Then whose property is it? Dorian's, of course. He's a very lucky fellow. This picture will always remain young. It will never be older than this particular day in June. If only it could grow old instead of me. I would give my soul for that. You'd hardly care for such an arrangement, would you, Basil? Rather hard lines on your work. I should have checked very strongly. I'm sure you would, Basil. You like your art better than your friends. I'm no more to you than one of your green bronze figures. Not as much, I should think. Dorian, don't say things like that. No, your picture has taught me. Lord Henry Wotton is perfectly right. When I do find I am growing old, I shall simply kill myself. <laughs> Dorian, I've never had such a friend as you. You tell me that you could be jealous of material things in such a way? You're finer than any Yes, I'm jealous of that portrait. Why should it keep what I lose? Every moment it takes something from me. Why did you paint it? So that one day I shall be mocked by it? <laughs> Harry, this is your doing. It is the real Dorian Gray, that's all. It is not! But then if it is not, what has it to do with me? Well, I, I can't quarrel with my two best friends at once. Do you know, between you, you've made me hate the finest piece of work I've ever done. Well, it's only colour and canvas. I won't let it cut across our lives. I'll destroy it. Don't, Basil, don't! It would be murder. Do you appreciate my work? I was beginning to doubt it. Appreciate it? It's part of myself. I feel it. Well, when you're dry, you shall be varnished, framed, and sent home. I wish you two wouldn't squabble over that picture. You'd much better let me have it, Basil. That silly boy doesn't really want it, and I really do. If you let anyone but me have it, Basil, I'll never forgive you. It's yours, you know that. I gave it you before it existed. Why don't we go to the theatre tonight? There's sure to be something on somewhere. You too, Basil, won't you? I can't. I've got too much work to do. Besides, I hate dressing up. Then you and I shall go alone, Mr. Gray. I shall stay with the real Dorian. Is it the real Dorian? Am I really like that? Yes. <laughs> Just like that. Don't go to the theatre tonight. Stay and dine with me. I can't. Why? 
because I promised to go to the theater with Lord Henry. He won't like you any better for keeping promises. Don't go. Please. I'm going, Basil. Very well. Then goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Dorian. Come and see me soon. Come tomorrow. Certainly. You won't forget. No, of course not. I'll remind him. My hansom's outside, Mr. Gray. I can drop you off at your place. Goodbye, Basil. It's been such an interesting afternoon. Uncle George, I want to get something out of you. Money, I suppose. No, 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 it isn't money I want. It's only people who pay their bills who want that, Uncle George, and I never pay mine. I always deal with Brother Dartmoor's tradesmen. Consequently, they never bother me at all. Now, what I want is information. Useless information, naturally. Well, uh, I can tell you anything that's in an English blue book. Ah, but these fellows write such a lot of nonsense nowadays. When I was in the diplomatic, things were much better. Now, I hear... They let them in by examination. <laughs> what do you expect? Examination, sir, are pure humbug from beginning to end. If a man's a gentleman, he knows quite enough. And if he isn't a gentleman, whatever he knows is bad for him. Mr. Dorian Gray does not belong to blue books, Uncle George. He's old Lord Kelso's grandson, and his mother was a Devereux, Lady Margaret Devereux. I want you to tell me about her. Who did she marry, for instance? You've known nearly everyone in your time. Oh, of course, I knew an extraordinarily beautiful girl. Made all the men frantic, running away with some penniless nobody, a subaltern in a foot regiment, something of the kind. Yes, poor chap was killed in a duel at Spa just afterwards. Ugly business. They did say Kelso got some Belgian brute to insult his son-in-law in public and then paid him to spit him like a pigeon. Oh. The thing was hushed up, but Kelso ate his chop alone in the club for a long time afterwards, I can tell you. Yes, it was a bad business. Kelso brought her back, but she never spoke to him again, and then she died herself before the year was out, just after that boy in there was born. Hmm, good-looking fella. Takes after his mother. Mind you, don't go leading him astray, Harry. He should have some money waiting for him if Kelso does the right thing by him. Yes, I fancy he's going to be well off. She was the most glorious-looking creature I ever saw. Could have married anybody, but she was a romantic. All the women in that family were. The men were a poor lot, but the women were wonderful. Talking of silly marriages, what's all this fiddle-faddle I hear about Dartmoor marrying an American? Ain't English girls good enough for him? It's rather fashionable to marry Americans just now, Uncle George. I back English women against the world. The betting is on the Americans. They don't last, I'm told. Long engagements exhaust them, but their capital at a steeple chase, they take things flying. I don't think poor Dartmoor has a chance. <laughs> Who are her people? Has she got any? American girls are as clever at concealing their parents as English women are at concealing their past. Oh. Pork packers, I suppose. Oh, I hope so, Uncle George, for poor Dartmoor's sake. I am told that pork packing is the most lucrative profession in America after politics. Oh. Is she pretty? She behaves as if she were beautiful. All American women do is the secret of their charm. Oh, why can't American women stay in their own country? They keep on telling us it's a woman's paradise. It appears to be. That is why, like Eve, they're so anxious to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he really will marry this fascinating young person? I believe she's made up her mind to propose to him, Duchess. Oh, how dreadful. Really, somebody should interfere. I'm told on excellent authority that her father keeps an American dry goods store. Dry goods? Mm. What are American dry goods? American novels. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind him, my dear. He never means anything he says. When America was discovered... I wish to goodness it had never been discovered at all. Really, our girls have no chance nowadays. It's most unfair. Perhaps America has never been discovered. I would say 
It had merely been detected. <laughs> oh, come. I've seen specimens of the inhabitants. They dress well, and most of them are extremely pretty. They get all their dresses in Paris. Mm. I wish I could afford to. They say when good Americans die, they go to Paris. And where do bad Americans go when they die? They go to America. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, I'm quite vexed with you. Why are you trying to persuade our Mr. Gray to give up the East End? I can sympathize with everything except suffering. Harry, the people in Whitechapel are utterly wretched and unhappy. Well, there's something terribly morbid about the cult of modern sympathy. Come, come, Lord Henry. No, I know I should sympathize with a man who has toothache, but I don't. He, he may be in dreadful pain, but I can't stand him and I can't go near him. I simply want to get away from him. You can't get away from the East End. It's a very important problem. Quite. It's the problem of slavery. And we try to solve it by amusing the slaves. How would you change it, then? Well, I wouldn't change anything in England except the weather. <laughs> the 19th century has gone bankrupt through an over-expenditure of sympathy. How very comforting. I've always felt rather guilty when I came to see your dear aunt. You see, I take no interest in the East End either. In future, I shall be able to look at her without blushing. But your blush is so very becoming, Duchess. <laughs> ah, only when one was young. When an old woman blushes, it's not a good sign. Mr. Gray, I wish you could tell me how to become young again. <laughs> Can you remember any great errors that you committed in your early days? Only too many. Well, then commit them over again. To regain one's youth, one should repeat all one's follies. What a delightful theory. I must put it into practice. <laughs> a dangerous theory. <laughs> it's one of the great secrets. People nowadays die of a sort of creeping common sense. They discover too late that the only things one never regrets are one's mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I must go. Oh, must you? Yes, I must, dear. Lord Henry, you're quite delightful and dreadfully demoralizing. <laughs> Don't go yet, Edie. Yes, I must go, dear Agatha. Goodbye, Lord Henry. You must come and dine with us some night. For you, dear lady, I would throw over anybody. <laughs> that is very nice and very wrong of you. So mind you come Tuesday. Goodbye. Right. Bye. <laughs> You talk books away, Lord Henry. Why don't you write one? Oh, I'm far too fond of reading books to care to write one, Mr. Erskine. I should like to write a novel, certainly, but there's no public in England for anything except newspapers, reviews, primers, and encyclopedias. Of all the people in the world, the English have the least sense of literature. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. I myself used to have literary ambitions, but I gave them up long ago. However, I would like to talk to you about life. The generation into which I was born was very tedious. Mm. And now I'm due at the Athenaeum. It's the uh, hour when we sleep there. All of you, Mr. Raskin? Well, Forty of us in 40 armchairs. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go, Harry. Stay and talk with me. I thought you'd promised to go and see Basil Halbert. I'd sooner be with you. I've talked quite enough for one day. But just as you wish. Tell me about your wife. Tell you what? I saw you together at Lohengrin the other night. Am I to take it that you're already interested in the practicality of marriage? Yes, I am. Very much, sir. Indeed. You must tell me about it. If you remember, I was asking about your own wife. Oh, Victoria. Oh, she's a curious woman. A mania for going to church. And her dresses always look as if they'd been designed and arranged and put on in the middle of a tempest. She's usually in love with someone but as her passion is hardly ever returned, she's managed to keep most of her illusions. She does try to look picturesque, but always ends up looking untidy. Marriage. Never marry a woman with straw-colored hair, Dorian. Why, Harry? They're so sentimental. But I like people to be sentimental. My advice to you is, Dorian, don't marry at all. <laughs> Men marry because they're tired. Women, because they're curious. Both are disappointed. My life, Harry, is not one of your aphorisms. I think I deserve better of you than that. Who are you in love with? An actress. Oh, that's rather a commonplace debut. Oh, you wouldn't say so if you saw her. Who is she? Well, her name, if that's what you mean, is Sybil Vane. Never heard of her. Oh, nobody has. But they will do. She's a genius. How long have you known her? About three weeks. And where did you come across her? I'll tell you, Harry. But you must listen, and listen properly. 
I think a little while ago, before I met you, it might never have happened at all. I had been walking about London, just walking, just looking and watching people I passed or who passed me. Some of them seemed fascinating, simply to see. Some of the others terrified me and I'd hurry on without staying. Don't know what on earth I was expecting. Anyway, one night, I was out in the direction of your Aunt Agatha's famous East End. About half past eight, I passed by an absurd little theatre, all flaring gas jets and playbills. I looked at the programme, and it turned out that the play that night was Romeo and Juliet. Can't say I relished the idea of being confronted with Shakespeare in this odd little place, but by this time I got a bit interested in the atmosphere and thought I'd see out the first act. Romeo was like an old beer barrel, and Mercutio was played by the local comedian just in order to put in his favourite gags. <laughs> and then Juliet came on. Harry, she was the loveliest thing I've ever seen in my life. You said to me once that pathos left you unmoved, but that beauty, something merely beautiful, could fill your eyes with tears. I tell you, Harry, I could hardly see this girl for the mist of tears that came across my line of sight. And when she spoke, her voice, I'd never heard anything like it. Can't forget it, the evening. I can't forget her. She's everything in life to me. Every night I go and watch her. I see. Harry, why didn't you tell me what it is? Loving an actress. Because I've loved so many of them, Dorian. When one is in love, one always begins by deceiving oneself and always ends by deceiving other people. That is what is known in the world as romance. Oh, Harry, Sybil is the only thing I care about now. One night I threw her some flowers and she looked up at me. At least I thought she did. Every night of my life I go to see her and every night she's more marvellous. That is the reason, I suppose, why you never dine with me now. I thought you must have some curious romance on hand. You have. But it's not quite what I expected. Harry, I want you and Basil to come with me some night and see her. I'm not at all apprehensive. You'll see what I mean at once. Oh, very well. Oh, today is, what, Tuesday? Well, shall we fix tomorrow? What does she play tomorrow? Juliet. All right, the Bristol at 8 o'clock, and I'll pick up Basil. Oh, will you? Poor Basil. I haven't seen him for a week at least. You know, it's rather awful of me. He sent me my portrait in a most wonderful frame which he specially designed himself. To tell you the truth, I'm a fraction jealous of the picture for being a whole month younger than me. Don't forget about tomorrow. Mother, I'm so happy. You must see that. You do feel it. You do feel it. Happy? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about happy. What is it that he sees in me? I don't even feel humble. I feel proud, Mother. Yes, terribly proud. How did you love Father? Forgive me. But don't look that way. I must be as happy as you ever were. Just let it go on. Oh, my child, you're much too young to think of these things and what they entail. Well, what do you know of this young man? Not even his name. Oh, it all couldn't have happened at a worse time. What with James off to Australia? I must say, I do think you could have shown a little more consideration. I dare say he's rich, but what does that mean? Oh, don't say these things. Wait a moment while I change. Come in. Oh, it's you, James. Where's Sybil? She's changing. Are my things ready? Quite ready. Well, I hope you take to the sea, James, or at least that it takes to you. You will remember, it was at your own choice. You could have been a solicitor if I'd had my way. Solicitors are a very respected class of people. In the country, they often dine with the best families. I hate offices and I hate class. But you're quite right. I've chosen my own life. All I say to you is, keep a watch over Sybil. Don't let her come to any harm. Oh, you do talk very funny sometimes, James. Of course I'll watch over Sybil. What else do you think I'll do? I hear there's a gentleman who comes every night to the theatre comes back here to talk to her. Is that right? 
You're talking about things you simply don't understand, James. We're accustomed to receiving a great deal of attention in the profession. It's something you've never really understood. And many don't, or won't. It used to happen to me all the time. And that's when acting was really understood. As for Sybil, I've no way of knowing whether this present attachment of hers is serious or not. But all I do know is that the young man in question is a perfect gentleman. He's always most polite to me. And he has all the air of being very rich indeed. But you don't know his name? No. No, he hasn't yet revealed his real name. I confess that. I think it's quite romantic of him. I'd say he's probably a member of the aristocracy. Just watch over her. Mother, you've got to watch over her. Well, why are you talking to me like this? I've always looked after Sybil from first to last. And if he is a worthy gentleman, there's no reason why she shouldn't contract an alliance with him. Especially if he is a member of the aristocracy. And he has all the appearance of it, I must say. It'd be a brilliant marriage for Sybil. They'd be quite a couple. His looks are really remarkable. Everybody notices them. Oh, how serious you both look. What's the matter now? Nothing. Goodbye, Mother. Oh, goodbye, son. Take care in all that wet weather. I'll see you later, Sybil, dear. I'll get a drop for both of us round the corner. All right. Everything will be all right for both of us. You'll come back from Australia with everything you want, and I'll be here in London with everything I want. We'll all be together, and that's what life will be like. Jim, you're not listening to a word I'm saying. I've just set out the most exquisite plans for both of us. Now, say something to me, please. What would you like me to say? <laughs> just that you'll be a good boy and not forget us. I think you're more likely to forget me than I am to forget you, Sybil. What do you mean? You have a new friend, I hear. Who is he? Why haven't you introduced me to him? Does he mean you any good? Stop it. You're not to say anything against him. I love him. Someone whose name you don't even know? Who is he? I have a right to know. If only you could see him, you'd think him the most wonderful person in the world. Oh, someday you will. When you come back from Australia, you'll like him so much. Everybody does. And I love him. I just wish you could come to the theatre tomorrow. He's going to be there. And I'm playing Juliet. What about that? To be in love and play Juliet. I should probably frighten the company to death. Dear Jim, you were leaving me when I'm happier than I've ever been before. Life's been hard for both of us, but it'll be different now. You're going to a new world, and mine's already found. Well, mine isn't, and I don't believe in yours. I wish to God I did. Love makes people good. Do you believe that? I'm going. But I tell you this. If he ever does you any wrong, I shall kill him. I don't believe it. It's perfectly true. To who? Some little actress, Arthur. I don't believe it. Dorian's far too sensible. Dorian's far too wise not to do foolish things now and then, my dear Basil. Marriage is hardly a thing one can do now and then, Harry. Except in America. And I didn't say he was married. I said he was engaged to be married. There's a great difference. But one only has to think of Dorian's birth and position and wealth. To marry a girl like that is unthinkable. If you want to make him marry this girl, tell him just that. He's quite sure to do it then. Whenever a man does a thoroughly stupid thing, it's so often from the noblest motives. Well, I hope she's all right. Oh, she's better than all right. She's beautiful. Dorian says she's beautiful, and he's not often wrong about that sort of thing. You know, your portrait of him has quickened his appreciation altogether, especially about people's personal appearance. And that's not the only effect it's had on him. Anyhow, we, you and I, are going to see her tonight. 
that it's provided Dorian hasn't forgotten all about us and his delirium. Harry, you're not serious. I think I should be miserable if I was ever more serious than I am at this moment. But you can't possibly approve of this business. It's an infatuation, surely. I neither approve or disapprove of anything now. It's an absurd attitude to take towards life. Dorian meets a beautiful girl who happens to play Juliet and falls in love with her. Well, why not? I, for one, hope that he will make this girl his wife, passionately adore her for six months, and then suddenly become fascinated by somebody else. Harry, you don't believe a single word of that. If anything happened to upset Dorian Gray's life, no one would be more upset than you. You're much better than you pretend to be. The reason we like to think so well of others is because we're afraid for ourselves. We praise the banker in order that he may allow us to overdraw our account, or even try and find good qualities in the burglar in the hope that he'll leave our property alone. I mean everything I've said. I have nothing but the greatest contempt for optimism. Harry, my dear Basil, you must both congratulate me. I've never been so happy. Of course, it's sudden and all that, but all the really delightful things are. It seems to be the one thing I've been looking for all my life. Well, I hope you'll always be as happy as this, Dorian, but you know, I don't know whether I can quite forgive you for not letting me know about your engagement you told, Harry. Yes, and I don't quite forgive you for being late. Now, come and sit down, Dorian, and tell me what it is that's been making you so happy. Well, there isn't really very much to tell. After I left you yesterday evening, Harry, I went down and had some dinner at that little Italian restaurant in Rupert Street you introduced me to, and at eight o'clock went down to the theatre. Sybil was playing Rosalind. Of course, the scenery was dreadful and the Orlando absurd, but Sybil, you should have seen her. Of course, our engagement's a dead secret. I shouldn't be telling you all this, but I can't help it. At what particular point did you mention the word marriage, Dorian? And what did she say in reply? Or perhaps you've forgotten all about it. My dear Harry, I didn't treat it as a business transaction. And I suppose I never made any formal proposal. Well, what did you say then? That I loved her, of course. She said, oh, something about not being worthy to be my wife. <laughs> something like that. Women are wonderfully practical. Much more practical than we are. In situations of that kind, we so often forget to say anything about marriage, and they always remind us. Leave it alone, Harry. You're only annoying, Dorian. Dorian is never annoyed with me. No, I don't mind. It's impossible to be angry with you. When you see Sybil Vane, then you will know that anyone who could consider wronging her would be a monster without a heart at all. I can't understand how anyone wants to degrade the thing he loves. I never have. I love Sybil Vane. When I am with her, I regret everything else I've ever learned. The simplest touch of her hand makes me forget you and all your theories about life, love and pleasure. Pleasure is the only thing worth having a theory about. Believe me, no civilized man ever regrets a pleasure. And no uncivilized man ever really knows what a pleasure is. I know what it is. It's to adore someone. Oh, that's better than being adored. It's a downright nuisance. When women worship someone, they're always bothering them to do something for them. Well, I should have thought that whatever they ask for, they've already given first. They create love in one's nature. They've a right to demand it back. That's quite true. Nothing is ever quite true. Well, this is. Can't you admit, Harry, that women give men the very essence of themselves? Possibly, but they invariably want it back in such very small change. That's the worry. Women, some witty Frenchman once put it, only inspire us to do masterpieces and then always prevent us from carrying them out. I don't know why I like you at all. You will always like me, Dorian. I represent to you all the sins that you have never had the courage to commit. And now, after all that, you must have a cigarette. A cigarette is the perfect type of the perfect pleasure. It's delicious, and it leaves one unsatisfied. What more can one ask? What utter rubbish you do talk, Harry. Come on, let's get down to the theatre. Yes, just, just give me a moment, Dorian. When Sybil Vane comes on the stage, then it will be your turn to find a new ideal of life. She may represent something that even you have never experienced. I have known everything, but I'm always ready for a new emotion. I'm afraid that in this case, however, there's no such thing. Still, your wonderful girl may be thrilling, at the very least. I love acting. So much more real than real life. Well, let's go then, Dorian. You come with me. No, Basil, there's no only room for two of us in the brougham. You can follow in a hansom.
I'm most awfully sorry I made you both waste an evening. I apologize. My dear Dorian, I expect Miss Vader's probably ill. We'll come again some other night. I wish she were ill, but she's simply callous and cold. She's altered entirely. Last night I thought she was a great artist. This evening she's merely commonplace and mediocre. Don't talk like that, Dorian, about anyone that you love. Love is a more wonderful thing than art. They are both simply forms of imitation. Don't pay any attention to him, I beg of you. I see what you mean, and I believe in that. Anyone that you love must be marvellous. And any girl that can produce the effect that you described to us must be very extraordinary and unique. To have produced that effect in you, why, that is worth doing in itself. Your idea of marriage is quite right. I, I didn't think so at first, but now I admit it freely. Sybil Vane was made for you. Without her, you would have probably been incomplete for the rest of your life. Thank you, Basil. I knew you would at least try to understand. I think we should go. You too, Dorian. It isn't good for one's morals to see bad acting. Besides that, I suppose you'll want to see your wife act much longer. So what does it matter if she plays Juliet like a wooden doll? She's very lovely indeed. And if she knows as little about life as she does about acting, she'll be a delightful experience. Now, my dear boy, don't look so tragic. Come and drive down to the club with Basil and me, and we'll drink a toast to the beauty of Sybil Vane. She is beautiful. What more can you want? Please go, Harry. Take him with you, Basil. Oh, Harry. Dorian! I acted so badly tonight. Horribly. You were dreadful. Are you ill or something? Haven't you any idea what it was? You obviously have no idea what I went through. Dorian, you should have understood. But you understand now, don't you? Understand what? Why I was so bad tonight. Why I shall always be bad. Why I shall never be any good again. You are ill. When you're ill, you shouldn't go on. You make yourself ridiculous. My friends were bored. I was bored. Dorian. Before I knew you, acting was the one reality of my life. I only lived for the theatre. I thought it was all true what went on. And then you came. Oh, my dearest, you freed me from all that. You taught me reality. Tonight, for the first time in my life, I saw the hollowness of everything I devoted myself to. You'd made me understand what love really is. Take me away, Dorian. Take me away with you where we can be quite alone. I hate the stage. You see what a blasphemy it would be to play at being in love. You have killed all that. Yes, you killed it. You used to stir my imagination, now you don't even stir my curiosity. In fact, you produce no effect on me at all. I loved you because you were a marvelous thing, because you seemed to give substance to all things I'd ever dreamed of. You have thrown that away. You are shallow, you are stupid. My God, what could I have been thinking of? You are a nothing. I'll never see you again. I'll never think of you. I'll even forget your name. I only wish I'd never laid eyes on you. And what little you know about love if you say it mars your art. Without your art, you're nothing. I would have made you famous, splendid, magnificent. You'd have been worshipped by everyone and my name would have been on you. What are you now? A third-rate actress with a pretty face. You're not serious, Dorian. You're acting. Acting? I leave that to you. You do it so well. Dorian! Uh, Never touch me again. Dorian! Dorian, don't hit me! I'm so sorry I didn't act well. I was thinking of you all the time. But I will try, believe me, I will. It came so suddenly across me all my love. I'll work hard. I'll improve. Don't be cruel to me because I love you better than anything in the world. After all, it's only once I haven't pleased you. But you're quite right, Dorian. I should have shown myself more of an artist, more. It was foolish of me, and yet I couldn't help it. Oh, don't leave me. Don't leave me. There's always something ridiculous about the emotions of people whom one has ceased to love. I'm going now. I don't wish to be unkind, but I can't see you again. You have disappointed me. That is all. <gasps>
rang, monsieur? No. Of course I didn't ring. Oh, yes, I did. It's too cold for monsieur. Shall I close the window? No, I'm not cold. Yes, shut it. Will there be anything else, monsieur? What? Did you see that Miss Vane got my letter? I delivered it myself, monsieur. Although the house was very difficult to find. Well, did you give it to her personally? No, monsieur, but I gave it to someone who called herself the landlady. She seemed rather cross at being disturbed, but uh, she promised it would be delivered into the right hands. Very well, Victor. I'm not at home to anyone except Miss Vane. And Lord Henry, monsieur. What about him? I told you I'm only at home to Miss Vane. Do you remember that, Victor? Miss Sybil Vane. It's just that his man brought round a letter first thing this morning, monsieur. It was marked urgent. But I left it on your breakfast tray. Yes, I got it. Well, it can't be that important. I'll read it later. Don't forget to let her in at once. That's all. Yes, monsieur. to see you. Forgive me if the thought of your shutting us up like this. I'm so terribly sorry for it, for you about it all, Lord Dorian, but you, you, you simply mustn't. You mustn't sit alone here brooding about it. You mean about Sybil Vane? Yes, of course, the whole thing's tragic from every point of view, but you mustn't. You simply mustn't think of it as your fault. Tell me, did you stay with her long after we both left? A while. I knew you would. Was there a scene? I was brutal. Yes, brutal and unforgivable, but that is over now. I'm not even sorry now for what happened, except for the pain I caused. At least it has taught me to know myself. Ah, oh, Dorian, I'm glad you couldn't look on it like that. I was afraid I'd find you in despair. No, that is all over. I'm as happy as I shall ever be. For one thing, I know what conscience is. And don't swear at that anymore. Not in front of me. I can see through it. I would like to be good as much as I can. I can't face the idea of my inner self being hideous any longer. Ah, and how do you propose to start this moral regeneration? By marrying Sybil Vane. Marrying Sybil Vane? But yes, Marianne. Harry, I know what you're going to say. Something tiresomely sarcastic about marriage. Well, don't. I've written again to Sybil since last night, and I've asked her again to marry me, if she'll have me. My mind's made up. She's going to be my wife. Sorry, my note. Didn't you get it? I sent it down earlier this morning by my own man. Your note? Oh, yes, I did get it, but I didn't read it. My mind was on Sybil. You know nothing, then? Nothing. Dorian, don't be afraid. That letter was to tell you that... Sybil Vane is dead. How dare you? That's the most horrible lie you've ever perpetrated. I'm sorry, Dorian, but it's quite true. It's in all the morning newspapers. I thought you'd have seen them by now. That's why I wrote you that note telling you not to admit anyone till I came round. There'll be an inquest, of course, but naturally you must not be mixed up in it. If anybody should have heard your name by any chance at the theatre, like the girl's mother, for instance, that can all be arranged. These things always can be. In France, it might make a man seem fashionable. But in London, people are so prejudiced. Here, one should never make one's debut with a scandal. One should keep that in reserve to give an interest to one's old age. I'm sure that nobody can have recognized either of us in that little place. Recognized? Inquest? What do you mean? Do you mean that Sib... Well, tell me the whole thing. I'm afraid there's no question of it being an accident, Dorian. Though, of course, it could be put that way to the public. And we all know they can be made to believe anything. Well, I won't bother you with the details now. You can read them all later. But it seems she was found dead on her dressing room floor. The newspapers say that she's swallowed something by mistake. Something they use in theatres for some reason. I don't know what it was, but it had either prussic acid or white lead in it. I should fancy it was prussic acid, as she seems to have died instantaneously. 
Well, that is something. But not very much, all the same. Yes, 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 it's very tragic, but you must not allow yourself to be mixed up in it. The Morning Post says that she was 17. I should have thought she was even younger than that. She looked such a child. Dorian, you're not to allow this thing to bring you down. I'll tell you what you will do. This evening you will come and dine with me. And afterwards we will look in at the opera. Yes, the opera. It's a pâté night and everyone will be there. You can come to my sister's box. She'll have some smart women with her. Sir, I have murdered Sybil Vane. Just as if I'd cut her throat myself with a knife. <laughs> the sun shines and the birds sing. And tonight I'm going to dine with you, then go on to the opera and sup somewhere afterwards. How extraordinarily theatrical this would have seemed if one had watched it happen. Somehow, now that it has happened, actually, and to me, it all seems too much to contemplate at one time. That was the first real love letter I've ever written in my life. The first. And that to a girl already dead. Did I really love her? Last night she tried to explain herself to me, but I wasn't moved one bit. She just seemed shallow to me. And then afterwards, something made me feel afraid. I don't know what it was, but it was horrible. I knew I'd done wrong, that I'd have to go back. Well, there she is, dead. Oh my God, Harry, what shall I do? I don't think you know the danger I'm in and there's nothing to keep me straight. Perhaps she could have done that for me. She'd no right to kill herself, no right. My dear Dorian, the only way that a woman can reform a man is by boring him so completely that he loses all interest in life. <laughs> If you had married this girl, you'd have been utterly wretched. Of course, you'd have treated her kindly. One can always be kind to people for whom one cares nothing. But she'd have soon found out that you were absolutely indifferent to her. And when a woman finds that out about her husband, well, I can only say that in any case, the whole thing would have been a complete failure. Yes, I suppose it would. Harry, why is it that I can't feel all of this as much as I want to? I know that I'm not heartless. Do you think I am? There's always some luxury to be had in self-reproach. But in this particular case, what is it that's happened? A girl has killed herself for love of you. I wish such a thing had ever happened to me. It would make me in love with love for the rest of my life. The people who have adored me, there have not been very many, but there have been some, have always insisted on going on long after I had ceased to care for them or they to care for me. The only charm of the past is that it is the past. I was inhumanly cruel to her. You seem to forget that. I'm afraid that women appreciate cruelty, downright cruelty, more than anything else. They have wonderfully primitive instincts. We may emancipate them, but they remain slaves looking for their masters all the same. I wonder if you know me as well as you seem to think, Harry. Now, Dario, I don't want us to talk about this again, ever. It has been an experience, that is all. I cannot think there can be much else in store. There is everything in store for you, Dorian. With all the gods have given you, there is nothing that you will not be able to do. And now you better dress and drive down to the club. We're rather late as it is. Now, I feel too tired to eat anything. I think I shall join you at the opera. What is the number of your sister's box? Oh, 27, I believe. It's on the grand tier. You will find her name on the door. But I'm sorry you won't dine with me first. I don't feel up to it. But I'm awfully obliged to you. For everything. We're only at the beginning of our friendship, Dorian. Goodbye. I shall see you before 9.30, I hope. Remember, Patty is singing. Monsieur? Yes. I shall be going to the opera this evening, Victor. Oh, well, monsieur. I'll put out your clothes. No, later will do. In the meantime, I want you to go round to Mr. Hubbard. He is the frame maker in South Audley Street. I have some pictures I want his advice about. 
I know the gentleman. Tell him it's most important, and I shall like him to come round as soon as possible. That's all. Oh, ask Mrs. Leaf to give you the key of the schoolroom. The old schoolroom, monsieur. So long since anyone went in there, it must be full of dust. I'm sure it's not fit for you to look at, monsieur. I see to it that she puts it in order before you go in there. I don't want it put in order, Victor, by you, Mrs. Leaf, or anyone else. I simply want the key. Do you understand that? Just as you wish, monsieur. I thought you might be covered in cobwebs if you went in there. Mrs. Leaf tells me it hasn't been open for nearly five years. Well, that is unimportant. I simply want to see the place, that's all. Yes, monsieur. Oh, Mr. Allward is waiting to see you. Shall I send him in? Yes. And then get off to the frame makers. Thank you, Victor. Oh, Dolly, I'm so glad to find you in. I met Harry outside in the street. He seemed bland about the whole affair. This must be awful for you. I thought you might be with the police or something. Why should I be with the police? Oh, and he said something about you actually going to the opera. Well, of course, I didn't believe that. Dolly, and I hope you don't get too involved. Involved? Why should I be involved? Well, you should know that better than I. Well, as a matter of fact, I am going to the opera. You are going to the opera? Yes. Why don't you come? I'm meeting Lady Gwendolyn, Harry's sister, for the first time. We're all meeting in her box. Dorian, Sybil Vane is lying dead in some lodging house, and you tell me that you're going to the opera? The girl you love hasn't even yet found a grave to crawl into, for all we know. Don't talk about horrid subjects, Basil. What is past is past. You call yesterday the past. All I know is that I don't want to be the mercy of my emotions. I want to use them, to enjoy them, and to dominate them. Something has changed you. To me, you look the same creature that used to day after day come to my studio, but then you were simple, natural, affectionate. But now I don't know what's come over you. You talk as if you had no heart, no pity in you. Is it Harry's influence? I owe a great deal to him, Basil, more than I do to you. You only taught me to be vain. Yes, well, I'm being punished for that. I don't know what you mean, or what you want. What do you want? I want the Dorian I used to paint. When I heard that Sybil Vane had killed herself... Killed herself? You mean there isn't any doubt about it? Well, surely you don't think it was a vulgar accident. Of course she killed herself. Dorian, how awful. Oh, there's nothing awful about it. It's one of the great romantic tragedies of the age. As a rule, people who act lead the most commonplace lives. They are good husbands or faithful wives or something tedious. You know what I mean. Middle class virtue and all that. How different Sybil was to that. She lived her finest tragedy. She was always a heroine. The last night she played, the night you saw her, she acted badly because she'd known the reality of love. When she knew its unreality, she died. As Juliet might have died. Her death has all the pathetic uselessness of martyrdom all its wasted beauty. I know you are surprised at me talking to you like this, Basil. You have not realized how I have developed. To become the spectator of one's own life, as Harry says, is to escape the suffering of life. Don't leave me, Basil. And don't let's quarrel. I am what I am. There's nothing more to be said. Well, Dorian, I won't mention this again after today. I only hope they don't mention your name in connection with it. Now, the inquest is this afternoon. Have they summoned you? You must do me a drawing of Sybil. I should like something more of her than the memory of a few kisses and a few words. Well, I'll do what I can, Dorian, if it will please you. But you must come and sit to me again. I can't get on without you. I can never sit to you again, Basil. It is impossible. Oh, my dear boy, what nonsense. Why, didn't you like what I did of you? Why have you put the screen in front of it? You know, it is the best thing I have ever done. Let me have a look at Basil, it. Basil, you must not look at it. I don't wish you to. Well, look at my own work. Are you serious? Why shouldn't I look at it? Don't! If you try to look at it, Basil, on my word of honor, I will never speak to you again. I'm quite serious. I don't offer any explanation, and you are not to ask for any, but remember, if you touch that screen, everything is over between us. Dolly. Don't speak. But, but what's the matter? Well, of course I won't look at it if you don't want me to, but really, this is rather absurd that I shouldn't look at my own work, particularly as I'm going to exhibit it in Paris this autumn. 
You want to exhibit it? Oh, yes, Georges Petit. He's going to collect all my best pictures for a special exhibition at the Rue de Sèze. Well, you told me a month ago you'd never exhibit it. You can't have forgotten. You assured me most solemnly that nothing in the world could induce you to send it to any exhibition. You told Harry exactly the same thing. Basil. Yes? We have each of us a secret. Let me know yours and I shall tell you mine. What was your reason for refusing to exhibit my picture? Just answer me one question. Have you ever noticed in the picture something curious? Something that perhaps at first didn't strike you and then suddenly revealed itself to you? I see that you did. Don't speak. Wait till you hear what I have to say. Dorian, from the first moment I met you, your personality had the most extraordinary effect of me. I was dominated, so brain and part by you. You became, for me, the visible incarnation of that unseen ideal. I worshipped you. I grew jealous of anyone that you spoke to. I wanted to have you all to myself. I was only happy when I was with you. When you were away from me, you were still present in my work. If I could never tell you this, you would not have understood. I hardly understood myself. I only know, and I knew then, that I had seen perfection face to face that the world has become wonderful in my eyes. Uh, too wonderful, perhaps, for in such worship there is danger. Weeks and weeks went on and I grew more and more absorbed. As I was painting, every flake and film of color seemed to reveal my love for you. You see, I felt I'd told too much, that I'd put too much of myself into it. And then it was that I decided that the picture could never be exhibited. But when I got this offer from Paris, I thought perhaps I'd been foolish in imagining that I'd seen anything more in it. So I, I determined to make your portrait this principal thing in my exhibition. It never occurred to me that you would refuse. I see now that you were right. The picture can never be shown. Dorian, you have been the one person who has really influenced my art. Anything that I have done that is good, I owe to you. Oh, you don't know. You just don't know what it cost me to tell you that. My dear Basil, what have you told me? Merely that you felt you admired me too much. That is not even a compliment. It wasn't intended as a compliment. It was a confession. And now that I've made it, something seems to have got out of me. It was a very disappointing confession. Well, what did you expect? You didn't see anything else in the picture, did you? There was nothing else to see? No. There's nothing else to see. Why do you ask? Basil, you and I are friends. We always will be. You have Harry. Oh, Harry. Harry spends his days in saying what is incredible and his evenings in doing what is improbable. But I don't think I'd go to Harry if I were in trouble, Basil. I'd sooner come to you. You will sit to me again. It's impossible. There is something fatal about a portrait. It has a life of its own. Well, I'm sorry that you won't let me look at it once more. But that can't be helped. And I do understand how you feel. Goodbye, Dorian. It's all right, I'll see myself back. Huh?
I've obtained the key to the schoolroom for Mrs. Leaf, monsieur. Very well. Leave it on the table. That's all. Oh, yes, only the person from the frame makers is here, monsieur. Mr. Hubbard. Yes, monsieur. Ask him to wait a few moments. <clears throat> I'll call him myself when I want him. Will there be anything else, monsieur? Yes, when Mr. Hubbard is gone, you can put out my clothes for the evening. I shall want to see him alone. Is there another key existing to the schoolroom? Mrs. Leaf tells me it is the only one, monsieur. She's most anxious to clean it. Yes, thank it you, Victor. That will be all. Coming, coming. Good afternoon, Mr. Gray. I'm so sorry for keeping you waiting, Mr. Hubbard. I was feeling a little unwell. How kind of you to come so soon. Always a pleasure to do anything for you, sir. Always. Drop anything, as they say, to oblige a gentleman like yourself. What can I do for you, sir? I thought I would do myself the honour of coming in person. I've just got a beauty of a frame, sir. Picked it up at a sale. Old Florentine. Came from Font Hill, I believe. I'm so sorry you gave yourself the trouble of coming round, Mr. Hubbard. I shall certainly drop in and look at the frame. But today, I only want a picture carried to the top of the house for me. It is rather heavy, so I thought I would ask you to lend me a couple of your men. Oh, there'll be no trouble there, sir. Delighted to be of any service to you. Which, uh, which is the work of art, sir? This. Can you move it? As it is. Cover and all. I don't want to get it scratched going upstairs. Oh, there'll be no difficulty there, sir. Uh, would you and I? Yes, you and I can manage well enough. Yeah. Lift. Oh. Now, where shall we carry it to, well, sir? If you'll follow me, Mr. Hubbard, I'll show you the way. I'm afraid it is rather heavy. It's on the top floor. We'll go up by the front staircase. It's wider. Behind the stairs, Mr. Harvard. Oh, yes, sir. Put it against the wall over here. I don't want to have it hung. That'll do. Thank you. Might one look at the work of art? No, it would not interest you, Mr. Hubbard. I shan't trouble you any more now. I'm much obliged for your kindness in coming round. Of course, Mr. Dorf. Ever ready to be in any service. <laughs> Extraordinary bit of luck running into you in Grosvenor Square like that. You know, I was here earlier. I waited for you for hours. Finally, I took pity on your tired servant and told him to go to bed. I hope you don't mind. I'm off to Paris on the midnight train, and I particularly wanted to speak to you before I left. My dear Basil, what is it all about? I hope it is not about myself. I am tired of myself tonight. I should like to be somebody else. It is about yourself. I think it is right that you should know some of the dreadful things that are being said against you in London. I don't wish to know anything about them. Scandals about other people I love. Scandals about myself don't interest me. Ah, that's Harry. Brandy? Thank you. They must interest you, darling. Mind you, I mean, I don't believe these rumours at all. At least I can't believe them when I see you. Sin is a thing which writes itself across a man's face. It cannot be hidden. Some people talk of secret vices. There are no such things. If a wretched man has a secret, it shows itself in the lines of his mouth, the drooping of his eyes, the moulding of his hands. But when I see your bright, innocent face, I can't believe anything against you. Mind you, I very seldom see you nowadays, and you never come down to my studio. And when I hear these 
These hideous things that are being whispered against you. I don't know what to say. Why is it, Dorian, that a man like the Duke of Berwick leaves the room of a club when you enter it? Basil, stop. You were talking of things you know nothing about. You ask me why Berwick leaves the room when I enter it. It is because I know everything about his life, not because he knows anything about mine. I know how people chatter in this country. In England, it is enough for a man to have brains and distinction for every common tongue to wag against him. And what sort of lives do these people who pose as being moral lead themselves? My dear fellow, you forget that we are in the native land of the hypocrite. That is not the question. England is bad enough, and English society is all wrong. That is, that is why I want you to be fine. But you have not been fine, Dorian. One has the right to judge a man by the effect he has over his friends. Don't shrug your shoulders. Don't be indifferent. Listen to me, Dorian. They say that you corrupt everyone with whom you become intimate, that it is sufficient for you to enter a house for shame of some kind to follow after. Well, I, mean, I don't know whether this is true or so. I don't know. Know you? Do I know you? I wonder. To answer that, I would have to see your soul. To see my soul? <laughs> but only God can do that. You shall see it yourself. Tonight. Come. It is your own handiwork. Why shouldn't you look at it? You can tell the world all about it afterwards. If you choose, nobody would believe you. If they did believe you, they would like me all the better for it. I know the age better than you do, though you prate about it so tediously. Come, I tell you, you have chatted enough about corruption. Now you shall look on it face to face. Don't say things like that, Dorian. They don't mean anything. You think so? Come upstairs, Basil. I keep a diary of my life from day to day, and it never leaves the room in which it is written. I shall show it to you if you come with me. Well, I've already missed my train. That doesn't matter. I couldn't go tomorrow, but don't ask me to read anything, Dorian. All I want is a plain answer to my question. That shall be given to you. Upstairs. I could not give it to you here. You will not have to read long. It is my birthday. Tomorrow you shall have lost your train. You insist on knowing? Yes, I do. I'm delighted. You are entitled to know whatever there is to know. You still think only God sees such things? Draw back the curtain. You're mad, Dorian, or you're playing a part. You won't. Then I shall. It's too late for prayer, Basil, if that's what you're thinking of.
Good evening, sir. I'm sorry. No, no, no Francis, it is I who I'm sorry. I seem to have forgotten my latchkey. What time is it? Ten minutes past two, sir. Ten minutes past two. How dreadfully late. You must wake me at nine tomorrow, Francis. I have some work to do. All right, sir. Did anyone call this evening? Mr. Howard, sir. He stayed here till 11, then he went away to catch his train. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't see him. Did he leave any message? No, sir, except to say that uh, he would write to you from Paris if he could not find you at the club. Very good, Francis. Don't forget to wake me at nine tomorrow. No, sir. Oh, yes, Francis, tomorrow. Tomorrow I shall want to see Alan Campbell of 152 Hartford Street, Mayfair. If he is out of town, I want his address. You understand? Very good, Mr. Gray. Good night, Francis. Good night, sir. Mr. Campbell, sir. Ask him to come in at once, Francis. Mr. Alan Campbell, sir. Alan, this is kind of you. I thank you for coming. I had intended never to enter your house again, Gray. You said it was a matter of life and death. Yes, Alan, it is a matter of life and death, and to more than one person. Sit down. Alan, in a locked room at the top of this house, a room to which nobody but myself has access, there is a dead man. He has been dead some hours now. Don't stir and don't look at me like that. Who the man is, why he died, how he died, and matters that do not concern you, what you have to do is this. Stop, Gray. I don't want to know anything more. Whether what you've told me is true or not doesn't concern me. I entirely decline to be mixed up in your life. Keep your horrible secrets to yourself. They don't interest me anymore. They will have to interest you, Alan. This one will have to interest you. I am sorry for you, Alan. But I can't help myself. You are the one man who is able to save me. I am forced to bring you into the matter. I have no option, Alan. You are scientific. You know about chemistry and things of that kind. You have made experiments. What you have got to do is to destroy the thing that is upstairs. Destroy it so that not a vestige of it will be left. Nobody saw this person come into the house. Indeed, at the present moment, he is supposed to be in Paris. He will not be missed for months. When he is missed, there must be no trace of him found here. You're mad, Dorian. I was waiting for you to call me Dorian. You're mad, I tell you. Mad to imagine that I would raise a finger to help you. Mad to make this monstrous confession. I will have nothing to do with this matter, whatever it is. Do you think I will imperil my reputation for you? What's it to me what devil's work you're up to? It was suicide, Alan. Suicide? Well, I'm glad to hear it, and who drove him to it? You, I shouldn't fancy. Do you still refuse to do this for Yes, me? of course I refuse. Alan, it was murder. I killed him. Murder? Is this what you've come You don't to? know what he had made me suffer. Look, I'll not inform upon you, but I will have nothing to do with it. You must have something to do with it, Alan, you must. All I ask of you is to perform a certain scientific experiment. You go to hospitals and dead houses, the horrors you do there don't affect you. If in some hideous dissecting room you found this man lying on a leaden table with red gutters scooped out for the blood to flow through, you'd simply look upon him as an admirable subject. You wouldn't turn a hair. All I'm asking you to do is merely what you've done many times before. And remember, it is the only piece of evidence against me. If it's discovered, I am lost. And it is sure to be discovered unless you help me. I've no desire to help you. Alan, I entreat you. You may know Terry yourself someday. But don't inquire now. I have told you too much as it is. But I beg of you to do this for me. We were friends once, Alan. Oh, don't speak of those to his Dorian. They're dead. The dead linger sometimes. The man upstairs won't go away. 
Alan, if you don't come to my assistance, I am ruined. They will hang me for what I have done. I absolutely refuse. It's insane of you to ask me. You refuse? Yes. I entreat you, Alan. Oh, it's useless. I am very sorry for you, Alan, but you leave me no alternative. I have a letter written already. Here it is. You see the address? If you don't help me, I must send it. If you don't help me, I will send it. You know what the result will be. Come. Don't work yourself into a fever. This thing has to be done. Face it and do it. You must decide at once. I cannot do it. You have no choice. Is there a fire in the room upstairs? Yes, there is a gas fire with asbestos. I must go home first. To get some things from the laboratory. No, Alan, you must not leave the house. Write down on a sheet of notepaper the things you require. My manservant will take a cab and bring them back to you. You are infamous. Absolutely infamous. Gosh. You have saved my life. Your life. What a life is that? Oh, I wish you had a thousandth part of the pity for me as I have for you. Now, there isn't a moment to be lost. I don't think I can go in, Alan. It's nothing to me. I shan't require you. Wait. Leave me. I'll do the thing you ask me. And now, let us never see each other again. You have saved my life, Alan. I'll not forget that. I'm going to kill you. You're mad. What have I done to you? Sybil Bain was my sister. She killed herself. I know it. Her death's at your door. I swore I would kill you. I had no clue, no trace, knew nothing of you but some pet name she used to call you. So make your peace with God, for tonight you are going to die. You're mad. I never heard of her. You'd better confess your sins, for you are going to die. Oh, please. I give you one minute to make please. your peace. One minute. That's all. No Stop. more. How long ago was it when your sister died? Quick, tell me. Eighteen years. But why do you ask me? What do years matter? Eighteen years. Set me under the lamp and look at my face. <laughs> No, don't help me, please. My God. My God. And I would have murdered you.
Who's that? Dorian. My dear boy, what on earth are you doing here? I was passing. I'd heard the studio was for sale. The door was open. But where have you been hiding yourself all this time? I haven't seen you for weeks. Come, you must tell me. No, Harry. I don't want to talk to you. I've done too many terrible things in my life and I'm not going to do any more. I did my first good action yesterday. Indeed, and where were you yesterday, may I ask? I was staying at a small inn in the country by myself. My dear boy, nobody can be good in the country. There are no temptations there. That is why all the people who live out of town are so absolutely uncivilized. Civilization is not by any means an easy thing to attain to. There are only two ways in which a man can reach it. One is by being cultured, and the other is by being corrupt. Country people have no opportunity of being either, so they simply stagnate. Culture and corruption, I have known something of both, thanks to you. I am going to alter. I think I have altered. Splendid, but you haven't yet told me what your good action was. Or did you perhaps do more than one? Come and sit down, Dorian, and tell me all about it. Oh, very well, Harry. It is not a story I could tell to anyone else. Yesterday I spared somebody. Now, that sounds conceited, but you understand what I mean. Hetty was simply a girl who lived in the village where I was staying. She was quite beautiful and wonderfully like that little actress, Sybil Vane. You remember Sybil Vane, don't you? How long ago that seems. Well, Hetty and I were to have gone away together this morning. We were perfectly in love. We adored each other. Suddenly, I determined to leave her just as I had found her. I should think the novelty of the emotion must have given you quite a thrill of pleasure, Dorian. But I can finish your idyll for you. You gave her some good advice and broke her heart. That was the beginning of your reformation. Harry, you are incorrigible. Hetty's heart is not broken. Of course, she cried and all that, but there's no disgrace on her. She can live. My dear Dorian, you have the most curiously boyish moods. Do you imagine that this girl will ever be satisfied now with any one of her own station? <laughs> I suppose she'll soon be married to some rough carter or grinning plowman. And the fact that she's known you and loved you will teach her to despise her husband and she will be wretched. From the moral point of view, I can't say I think very much of your great renunciation. <laughs> Even as a beginning, it's poor. No, Harry. Don't try to convince me that the first good action I've done for years, the first little bit of self-sacrifice I've ever known, is really a sort of sin. I want to be better. I am going to be better. No, I don't want to talk about it anymore. What is going on in town? Well, people are still discussing Poor Basil's disappearance. I should have thought they'd have got tired of that by this time. My dear boy, they've only been talking about it for six weeks. And the British public is really not up to the mental strain of more than one topic every three months. They've been rather fortunate lately, however. They've had my own divorce case, and then that brilliant Alan Campbell's suicide. Now they have the mysterious disappearance of an artist. Scotland Yard insists that the man in the grey Ulster who left for Paris on the midnight train was poor Basil. And the French police declare that Basil never arrived in Paris at all. <laughs> I suppose in about a fortnight we shall hear that he's been seen in San Francisco. It's an odd thing, but people who disappear are always said to be seen in San Francisco. It must be a delightful city and have all the attractions of the next world. And what do you think has happened to Basil? Oh, I haven't the slightest idea. If Basil chooses to hide himself away, as you've been doing lately, it's no business of mine. If he's dead, I don't want to think about it. Death is the only thing that ever terrifies me. I hate it. Why? Because we can survive everything nowadays except that. Death and vulgarity are the only two facts of the 19th century which one cannot explain away. I was very fond of Basil. Don't people say that he was murdered? Uh, some of the newspapers do. It doesn't seem to me to be at all probable. I know there are dreadful places in Paris, but Basil was not the sort of man to go to them. He had no curiosity. It was his chief defect. What would you say, Harry, if I told you that I had murdered Basil? I would say, my dear fellow, that you were posing for a character that doesn't suit you. All crime is vulgar, just as all vulgarity is crime. You have not got it in you to commit a murder, Dorian. I'm sorry if I offend your vanity by saying so, but I assure you it's quite true. Crime belongs exclusively to the lower orders. 
I can't say I blame them for it in the smallest degree. I fancy that crime must be to them what art is to us, simply a method of procuring extraordinary sensations. Don't, Harry. The soul is a terrible reality. It can be bought and sold and bartered away. It can be poisoned or made perfect. Do you feel quite sure of that, Dorian? Quite sure. How grave you are. Don't be so serious. What have you and I to do with the superstitions of our age? We've given up our belief in the soul. I am not the same, Harry. Yes, you are just the same. I am a little changed already. You will never change for me, Dorian. You and I will always be friends. Tell me, if you can, how you have kept your youth. You must have some secret. <laughs> You're quite wonderful, Dorian. You never look better than you do this afternoon. <laughs> you remind me of the first day I met you. You were rather cheeky, very shy. And absolutely extraordinary. You have changed, of course, but not in appearance. I wish you would tell me your secret. To get back my youth, I would do anything in the world, except take exercise, get up early, or be respectable. There's nothing like it. Goodbye, Harry. 